This so before I start, I may have mentioned to everyone that I, um, I'm going to put everybody on mute and this will help with the uh, background noises. And if you have any questions, you can always send them through the chat feature at the bottom and I will address them at the end. And so, um, as I said, we are being recorded. For those of you who aren't here, Guild Edge Africa, our headquarters in the beautiful city of our mother city in South Africa, and I'm here in our Austin, Texas office. And uh, that affords you, of course, to get 24-7 service when the system Cape Town closed down. All right, so moving along with Namibia. Uh, many of you may be aware Libya may not be the first port of call for a trip to southern Africa. And I think it is very underrated. People tend to uh, focus on southern Africa, North Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia. They've all got their appeal. Namibia is it. And often people say, what is there in the desert? What is the allure of the And that's exactly what I'm going to show you all today. So um, let's go forward. All right, this is a nice map of Namibia, and it's important to have a look at in terms of where, where the other uh, uh, countries are in uh, relationship to Namibia. We have Angola here in the north, Zambia over here in the west, uh, uh, sorry, in the east. You've got Botswana bordering, and then you've got South Africa. So it's actually very doable to uh, tag on Namibia, other countries in South Africa. They're all in pretty close proximity, and it makes sense if you have the time, uh, you know, to to do to do Namibia as well. Right over here is Windhoek, that is the capital of Namibia, and it is the gateway to all the destination that um, we like to visit when we visit this country. So uh, International Airport at Vinc. And I'm just going to point out a couple of areas that we're going to be chatting about so at least you can see their relationship uh, to Vintuk or to the country. So I'm going to start off here in the north with Atosha, which is the uh, Africa's oldest uh, game park, the Atosha game park. It's actually 111 years old. And we're going to be talking a little bit about that. A little further down, you've got Twyfeltine, an amazing, an amazing destination with 45,000 Bushman paintings, and it's got a very spiritual allure. There's Twyfeltine. Here you've got the Skeleton Coast. Many of you may have heard of the Skeleton Coast. It's a great attraction. I'm going to talk more about it. Just wanted to show you where it was. Quite frankly, it is a, it is a phenomena because it lies, uh, the desert lies adjacent to the ocean. And I'll tell you what's called the Skeleton Coast. We'll talk more about that. We've got Swakopmund, which is a beautiful coastal town. And that's over here on Atlantic on the west coast. Further down south here is Susufle, a great attraction. And the reason we go to Susufle is because of a, it has the tallest sand dunes in the world. And they're bright red. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, just wanted to give you sort of perspective of where things are on the map of Namibia. Hopefully you'll have uh, some reference as we go through these uh, stunning destinations. All right. So part of the allure of Namibia is that it contains four countries or four biospheres in one. They are totally different landscapes and each has its own characteristic and actions. And these four are the Namib Desert. The Namib Desert is the coastal desert that runs along the length of the country. Desert against ocean. And it has a lot of these amazing dunes, dry riverbeds, and canyons. Number two is the Central Plateau, which is actually home to the majority right in the center, which is where the international airport is. And it still has rugged mountains and, and sand-filled valleys. And then, of course, you have the Kalahari Desert. And this, of course, is an ancient desert. It has these red sand dunes, very sparse vegetation. That's what you expect in the desert. And last but not least is the Kavang and Caprivi area, which we don't normally visit. 
right at the top of um, of Namibia. I'll just kind of go back and show you here. It's called the Caprivi Strip, this little thin piece of land. But that is the fourth biosphere in Namibia. All right, access and logistics. Well, there are only a few international flights that fly into Namibia. They fly into Windhoek, which is the capital. You get them from Frankfurt, South Africa, and London. Now, Frankfurt is the, um, uh, you know, is, is obviously in Germany, and uh, Namibia used to be a German colony. It was called Southwest Africa back in the day, and it still has a great allure for German uh, visitors, and, and there's a lot of expats who live in uh, Namibia, and so you'll see quite a bit of German influence in the architecture. So that is why Frankfurt has been a direct flight. And at their uh, Jose Kutako International Airport, this is the international gateway to all the various de destinations that I pointed out to you earlier. There's also a little uh, a domestic airport, Eros Airport, close to Windhoek, and I'm, I'm bringing that up because uh, you'll, you'll note that Namibia is huge, and it's, it's, it's a very vast um, country. And uh, so many people traverse through little planes. And that's why we have the domestic airport. It's much easier to, um, to cover that much ground. And there's also a little airport at Wolfersby, which is on the, uh, on the west coast. And that access to Swakopmund, which is the coastal town, and the Skeleton Coast, which I also pointed out to you. So that is the, um, uh, that is the flight options. Now, there are three ways that you can traverse this huge uh, country. The first, most popular, of course, is fly in Safars. Okay, these uh, are those. You know, it, it's it's popular for those who are not keen to self-drive, who have time, and they have these light aircrafts that fly from these different um, airports to the major areas of interest. And the big uh, view that you can get from the sky of the great Namib Desert, you fly low down the desert and you see the seal colony. You also land on these grass airstrips. And these pictures down here give you a sense of what the aerial view looks like. This picture on the left is a perfect example of desert against ocean. Desert against ocean. And uh, in this picture over here, I'm actually going to make mention while I'm at it. Uh, you can see the mist, and what happens is, is that there is this cold current from the Atlantic on the west, this cold Bengula current, and it actually um, moves alongside this murderous heat of the of the desert, and it creates this fog, this big bank of sky of of clouds, and these little airplanes fly in between the mist, and uh, you get to see of course, uh, the um, the, the, the sea and the desert below. And it's this mist and it's this phenomena of having the ocean and the desert next to, to each other that has caused a lot of wrecks. And these wrecks, these should have happened because they can't really see where the desert is and where the uh, the ocean ends. And so you'll get a lot of these shipwrecks that you can see aerial from, from, the, from, from above. Quite, a, quite strange and quite a phenomena. So those are some great real shots. A stunning shot just to show you the vast uh, expanse of the desert. And uh, in certain parts, of course, it's red. And uh, the colors can morph, especially in set. It's just magical. You go from these yellow ochres, and, and it's just absolutely amazing. Great allure of desert. So in addition to flying, there's also, of course, uh, self-drive. And this is by far the most popular way to visit Namibia because the, um, uh, the, the flights are not for cost conscious. It can be a little pricey to do the trip with, the, um, with these flights. So many people use a two-wheel car drive or a four-wheel drive, and uh, guests are provided a full itinerary, detailed route maps, or as some of you like to say, route maps, and all the information you'll need to self-drive. So it's actually very simple to do. The distances may appear daunting. It's a big country, but Namibia roads are excellent. The infrastructure is great. They straight and they empty. There's not a lot of traffic, so it's very, very easy to do. 
and as I said earlier, most economical way. And it gives you complete freedom to create your own adventure and you can travel at your own pace. So that is the self-drive option. A couple of pictures of uh, lion sightings left. And then, of course, the third option is guided safaris. So if your guests are not interested in driving themselves, but they want to travel by road, they can either join a small group, and this is a guided group, or they can ar uh, uh, um, arrange a privately guided trip. So those are the three options of traveling and being the sites in Namibia. Air, uh, ground, or guided tour. That's a stunning picture. Just want to expand. Now, this is definitely off-road. These are not the roads that self-drive tracks typically go on, but you certainly can. And as you can see, it certainly has, um, uh, you know, an amazing vista. What areas of interest? The first one is Swampwind, and I meant, mentioned this was on the coast, so it's a very popular coastal holiday town on the edge of the desert and as I said there is a great German influence so you'll see a lot of the German architecture uh, visible in the in the, um, in the ships and also in the um, in the homes definitely what's are available are these marine tours you can do whale watching and dolphin watching and because it is right next to the desert there's also these um, activities like the quad biking and boarding, sand skiing, very diverse. There's also tours to cross where there's this little seal colony, and uh, you can also go in search of living fossils. The extraordinary giant Welwitchia plant is being is able to be seen as well. So, you know, Namibia is really, really an ancient country, and it has, as I said, all these plants in the world, and the geology, um, and the topography is is like being in another. It. You'll see that this, this desert, it's certainly of, of the age of the country. So uh, move on, we'll move on from Swakopmund. Just wanted to show you an aerial view. Here, of course, you see the ocean and you see the, uh, you know, the sand. And then in the background there, you can see the desert. So it's, it's really, again, you know, the sand and ocean phenomena. But it's a lovely town. And it's actually quite sophisticated with that European influence. All right, the next destination after Swakopmund, this coastal town, is the Otosha National Park. And to you, it's one of the oldest main parks in Africa. And um, the name Otosha uh, means white place. And the Bushman name, that means land that shimmers with water rains. And you'll notice in the Otosha, that the uh, um, the pans, it's named the pans, and it has these seasonal floods, and it draws great herds of birds and animals. But the big thing about the pans is that they are white from lime and salt. And so this is the whole region. It gives this Tosha a white look, and it's completely unique to any of Africa's other great game reserves. So, you know, when you go to South Africa and you visit the Kruger National Park, or you go to Botswana, where you have the lush water activities when the floods happen in Botswana. And, and when you go to Africa, you see these plains which on for miles, the Serengeti and the Masai Mara. Well, in Natasha, you've got these white pans, and that's what makes it unique. So every destination in Africa has its own very unique safari option. This is the one here in uh, Tosha. And, you know, the um, uh, the game park, you know, of course, is surrounded by desert. So you'll see a lot of animals in the Otosha that are adapted to living in the desert. Sort of, uh, impala is the black-faced impala. You've got the little uh, Damara diptych and roan antelope. And um, there are also animals in the Namib desert, elephants and lion, which I'll talk about a little later, that are also desert-adapted animals. So it's quite fascinating. The other thing about the Atosha uh, is the fact that it, uh, the game lodges are in private concessions that adjoin the park. And the good, 
this is it allows for gain drives and off-roading. So it's got a lot more uh, sense of adventure. So that's your Atosha National Park, which is in the northern part of Namibia. Here the cheetah. Don't see a lot of cheetah around. You do get to see quite a lot in Atosha. And then there is the skeleton coast that I mentioned earlier, the skeleton coast where the ocean meets the, um, the desert and you get these banks of, um, of mist that you fly through. It stretches from the northern one-third of Namibia shore and it has unbelievable sights, as I mentioned below. Expect breathtaking scenery, great sweeping vistas of desert and ocean and sky, and this lends to this total feeling of isolation. And when I was there, I remember the sound of the wind, you know, and the, sa and the sand and the, and the ocean creating this, this sort of mysterious sound almost as well. So it has this very ethereal quality to it. Um, so the, uh, the shipwrecks are visible from, from above, as I mentioned, as well as a lot of beached whale skeletons, and it, this adds to this dramatic landscape, gives this meaning of skeleton coast um, to, you know, this park. Um, Got to say, despite the fact that it's called the Skeleton National Park, it does house a great variety of wildlife. Lions with their black mane, the black-maned lion, which are absolute cunning and reek. The desert elephant and uh, they, for example, they regurgitate their food so they can actually absorb every little ounce of moisture um, from from their food intake. They also have, you know, smaller ears and uh, these are all sorts of, sort of physical and uh, biologically adapted things that these animals do to survive in the desert. You've also got black rhino, which is rare throughout a lot of the, the other park. You have the black back and you have all the desert adapted ant antelope that I'd made earlier on. So um, that is the uh, big attraction of the Skeleton Coast. By the way, its um, Bushman name or its local name is, is, is uh, in English is the land God made in anger. So, uh, because it's not very hospitable, it has got this kind of really interesting name. But in all of this creates the uh, to this whole to this whole country. That is a, a very typical picture of Namibia. That is the oryx. It's the national animal of Namibia. And these animals, they, goodness, live in, in, in murder. And what they do is that they can push blood through to their nostrils. And by doing this, it cools their, their bodies down so they can, they can live in, the, in, these, uh, in these high temperatures. But a very regal animal with those straight horns, and it's just absolutely gorgeous. And that background with the red desert, it's Namibia. That is a that is a wonderful advertisement uh, for Namibia. The next destination is an area called Demoraland, and Demoraland is made up of lots of rugged mountains and um, sort of craggy, craggy mountains as well. And it's home forty five and approximately Bushmen engravings and paintings. And these Bushmen, they lived there for thousands of years, very spiritual um, uh, indigenous people. And these paintings depict all sorts of sort of spiritual spiritual things. Some of the, some of the paintings show pictures of humans, fused animals. Uh, many of the animals, which will get your ball fused with lion, for example. And there is this kind of, um, you know, typical experience, you know, from this. Um, Twyfeltine, which is a wonderful rocky outcrop, for example. Um, it's very arid and very remote, and it has all these carvings. And it's, uh, you know, it depicts when is is bigger and people are smaller. And... Um, uh, it has this very transcendental energy, and a lot of locals don't like to be there at the dark. They say that it's scary. So there's some kind of fear of the ancestors and the spirits. But quite frankly, uh, this, this whole experience, this transcendental energy is, is very, very magical. And again, wherever you are in the country at sunset, when these uh, mountains and rugged uh, terrain shift colors, it's just it, it adds 
whole sort of mystical experience. So um, it sits between the Skeleton Coast and the Atosha, which is in the north. And you also have Spitzkopper, uh, a finger clip, which are these amazing rocks and these that, that just um, tower above the earth. And they also, of course, the petrified forests. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that. Um, these, these petrified forests, they usually uh, in the path of rivers that, that um, flowed from this area to the ocean. And due to nature, the river changed their uh, direction. So as a result, you know, trees never received water anymore. But you can still see these kind of pans that they sit in. But the trees have lost all their, their, uh, their moisture and they've become petrified. And they are like uh, rock. And uh, to see them, I'm going to show you a few pictures further. On. It's it's in dead flay. It, it's absolutely a man, you know, desert. You, it, it brings up all these mysterious things that you would never have thought um, are actually, um, uh, you know, are, are actually connected with a desert environment. So Damaraland, um, this is just giving you some example of these rocky out outclips, and as you as you're driving along, there's smaller ones all along the way. Uh, it just looks like the land has ruptured with rock and um, mountain. Just absolutely amazing. And then the next uh, destination that uh, Namibia is famous for is the Namib Desert and Sutufle, and this desert is us is. It's one of the last, is one of the oldest, sorry, deserts in the world, and it's one of the largest conservation areas. And the famous Sosufle is there because of the tallest red sands in the world. Dune 45, for example, is the most photographed and the most often climbed. And I have to say that when I was there, I climbed up the spine of Sosufle, very tenuous. And when you get to the top, you have the opportunity to run down these dunes and the sand is extremely fine and it comes to your knees even beyond your knees very deep very far as a result you can only run down in a zigzag fashion going straight down you'll probably disappear <laughs> so it was such an exhilarating experience to run down these dunes that i actually uh, uh, packed myself up and i climbed a second time and ran down twice in a row. It was truly a peak experience. Left all the way down. It was just so exhilarating. So, um, so you've got that. You've got the high sand dunes. It's an amazing area to do hot air ballooning as well. And um, we did the hot air ballooning where you go early in the morning before sunrise, and your balloon is actually when the um, when the sun is rising over the desert landscape. And you for a couple of hours and you come down and they set out these tablecloths for you and you have breakfast in the early morning in the desert. Truly amazing. So the hot air ballooning and going up the um, Dune 45 is phenomenal. Also, the stargazing at night in the desert, as you imagine, is off the charts. Totally off the charts. It's so bright. You, of course, you're seeing the Southern Cross. This is the complete opposite to... Um, to the US, you're seeing the others, and you see the Milky Way, and it's just amazing. There are often astronomers out there, and also Namibia has one of the largest um, observatories because of this phenomena of the dark skies. Also, you find horseback riding, you'll get the bike, and you get the sand boarding, all that sort of thing that happens with things. And the night game drives are an absolute must. You get to see the nocturnal desert wildlife under the cross and the African sky. So absolutely beautiful, the desert and um, play. Um, all right, let's see. Um, lovely picture of hot air ballooning in the early morning. And now I'm just going to tell you a little bit about some of the country information. The main language is English. It has other languages, including German, because of the German origin, and Afrikaans, which is actually a South African language. A lot of other tribal languages, like Oshiwambo, but English is, is, is prevalent. Population, 2.2 million. The currency is the Namibian dollar, but uh, they do exist uh, quite uh, easily. The um, US dollar and the South African rand, ZAR. 
health, no vaccines are required. And anti-malaria medication is suggested traveling to, for example, Tosha, the north of the country between December and March, which is when it's very hot and rainy. But often people refer to Natasha as malaria free. So if you're not going during those months, um, you don't even have malaria tablets. So plus, for your visas, a U.S. citizen can get a tourist visa on arrival in Namibia. And I put in parentheses there, subject to change, because Africa's visas are always changing. Um, but you know, typically, you know, like Zimbabwe and Zambia and Swamp, Namibia, you can get the border. Always check with your consultant though, before going to make sure that your client's latest information. But uh, at this point, very easy to get a visa. Just quickly showing you the night, the night sky, the quad bikes, and also you know the elephants and um, uh, uh, the property of all the different game. Definitely land of contrast. Just going to quickly mention the traveling with children. Uh, children older than six. Um, allowed of the game drives children over 12 are allowed to go on bush walks but they do feel they do restrict any 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 younger kids the other thing that i'm just mentioning it's the same throughout botswana and south africa is that children this is actually recent fear children under 18 years traveling to the country ports of entry have to have an unabsorbed certificate and this is all around child trafficking laws that are uh, happening a lot in Africa. And in the event one parent is not traveling with the other child, you have to get an affidavit from the other parent to giving consent and it has to be um, presented. So as I said, requirements are similar to the ones produced in South Africa, also most recently in Botswana. So as a result, it should not affect many guests because who are traveling through South Africa, travel to Namibia through South Africa, have already got the correct documentation. did want to mention uh, that little um, hurdle. That is by dead flay. I wanted to put it up earlier, but you can see these pear by trees um, in the sort of flay over here. Um, and then, of course, the, the red sand dunes in the background. Very typical picture of Namibia. Climate and weather. Let's just go down the box over here. The best time to go is in here, winter, which is our summer. So June to October is the best time to go. And the reason for that is because in the dry season, the animals um, uh, move away from the water holes. I'm sorry, in the wet season, they move away from the water hole. They've got plenty of water. And so it's harder to find or they scatter over the place. So that is why their winter is the best time to go. High sea is July through October. Uh, it never really feels crowded in Namibia, for example, to Africa at this time of the year. Low season, September to April. And the best weather, as I said, is April and May, which is little to no ra rainfall. And worst weather is November to February, where it's very hot and very muggy. So just to remember, best time is to go in their winter, our summer. Some pictures of the um, of the of the of the gravings and things on rocks. As I mentioned, there were forty-five thousand of these in lots of you know uh, a combination of human and animal, and it's spiritual and it's fabulous to see these very ancient carvings. All right, I'm just going to go through a couple of lodges, and um, I'm going to be showing lodges that are mostly kind of five star or four star scale and um, none of them have really more than 10 chalets so uh, huge groups uh, don't do very well in Namibia but you know you've got your 10 chalets, for example two people in each one that's 20 people that do have family unit well and, and single rooms but this is Marasha Lodge and um, a very very elegant that's a much better you can see it's got this, um, uh, you know, elegant, uh, uh, subdued kind of coloring. It's lovely. Now you've got in the as well, which is the game of the Ovongo Ongava Lodge, sorry, which is a wilderness property. Uh, here they've got 14 fat um, chalets, and it's on a hill overlooking the watering hole. So in the picture on the right, that's the watering hole, and this is the deck. And so you can literally sit there at night and watch the animals come to the deck. Beautiful vistas, 
And what I've loved about Namibia is that because there uh, aren't a lot of mosquitoes or, or bugs, you can open up the entire uh, window and you can see the expanse. And for example, in this particular lodge, you can move the beds out onto the deck. And so you can sleep out on the see the stars at night. So just absolutely magnificent. Now in the Skeleton Coast, where I mentioned they've got the shipwrecks, they've got this brand new lodge. It's called Shipwreck Lodge. And it actually looks like a shipwreck, as you can see. Um, absolutely extraordinary with amazing landscapes and wild sightings. Um, and here's, here's another great picture of it. Very popular and it's literally just opened this year. So it's just um, stunning. And again, all the lodges have the sand colors. You're not going to see any bright Hawaiian or Mexican colors. It's all kind of due to go landscape. And Cerro Cofima is another beautiful camp, um, and it's it's um, all so elevated. And um, it was, by the way, recently refurbished this year. Here are some stunning pictures of well. It's a great uh, uh, accommodations in Namibia. You've also got um, Honib uh, Valley Camp. Again, here in the desert. And by the way, the food is phenomenal. Absolute gourmet. So it's... Uh, uh, oh, and I want luxury camps. Some of them are permanent and some of them are tented. So you've got that choice. In Damara land, this, this is, of course, where open paintings are at Twyfeltain. You've got the Mawami, uh, Mawani mountain camp. And they are situated right next to these massive boulders over here. And uh, the game drives are with low with guide, the Bushmen. And they, of course, have their knowledge and respect for the land and uh, give you great insight into the, into the local traditions. And, of course, these are stunning pictures of the camp right in these boulders. Absolutely amazing. The Moraland Camp, again, 10 large adobe-style thatched units. And... Um, all sorts of night day activities. Kulala Desert Lodge stayed there right on the top here. You can actually go up this ladder or you can go internally and you can spend the night on the roof, which again is just an amazing experience. Also a good area and sussuflate hot air ballooning. This, by the way, closest camp to access uh, the Sousafle Dunes. And the Sousafle Desert Lodge is stunning, very, very close. Also malaria-free. Look at this nice shot here of people having dinner out in the desert. Just amazing. I hope by now you've got to see that this desert can be so alluring and so majestic, despite the fact that it's so sparse and isolated. All right, and so I'm just going to be uh, ending off by letting you guys know that Gilt Edge Africa just won for the year in a row. Um, the World Travel Award, South Africa's leading luxury operator. So I had to put a little boast in there. And um, you definitely know that you're in very, very, very good hands. So this, you know, soulful place um, with, with a car changing, a place that to uh, provide you with solitude and a place to go and find yourself is what Namibia is all about. And so I just wanted to thank you all for joining Guild Edge Africa on the stunning visual adventure. And um, I just wanted to uh, let you all know that I have recorded this. So if anyone, I think Sue just asked, anyone who wanted to have this recording, um, I'm happy to send it off to you. And I hope it's going to be clear, my nifty new mic. And I'm hoping the sound is a lot better. So um, there it is. I wanted to thank everybody. And if there are any more questions, please feel free to um, please feel free to put them in the chat box. I can also unmute. Uh, let me just see if I can unmute everybody. Um, unmute. Well, some of you have muted yourselves. So I think the best thing is to send your questions down to the bottom and I can answer them otherwise you can email me but we are sitting by to provide you with just wonderful customized uh, experience to Libya and the Desert. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much.